So first, let me tell you a little bit about who we are so you understand from a perspective um, what we put on. Uh, we are a, uh, it's a part, it's part of my job is explaining what we do. We would traditionally call ourselves a buying group. Uh, a buying group is kind of the ho uh, Costco of the wholesale business. We're in the appliance, electronics, bedding, and home furnishings uh, industries, everything inside the sheetrock, essentially. So, you know, our shows are a little bit diverse. We do two shows a year, uh, one in the spring and one in the fall. Um, we typically have three to 4,000 attendees per show, and it's a rough 50-50 rough split between uh, true attendees and exhibitors. Um, you know, our format is not like an, is not unlike any of the other ones. It is, you know, you're typically going to have education, an expo floor, and some general business sessions that we run throughout our shows. So going back, we've probably done shows for about 20 years from a responsibility standpoint. I probably had the shows as a primary responsibility for probably the last uh, uh, just about three years. Um, we started by thinking about, you know, why do we do every single item on our show? And, you know, the first thing that we've always started about, what is our perfect event? What do we want it to be? What are we trying to get out of it? And for us, it's a little bit twofold. Because we work with vendors like Samsung and Whirlpool and LG, who all but two times a year, we spend time hammering on them for things like price and product and things we need. Then when it comes to event time, they're our best friends because we're trying to get them to do bigger booths, sponsorship, all the same things that all of you are faced with. So many times we have a little bit of a conflicting relationship. So we, we really dug in and looked at our shows to try and see, hey, what, what are the things that we're doing great? What are the things that we don't do so great? And really, why do attendees come back? Um, so for us, our perfect outcome is that every single one of what we call a member or a customer or an attendee, uh, how do we get every single one of those to come to one event a year? Now, you're never perfect and you're trying to get those, but that's really the outcome that we're trying to get. At the same time, we're trying to serve all those people that uh, pay for exhibit space. So what we started doing is we did a lockdown creative session two or three times a year that I literally invite everybody I can think of to sit and come up with the craziest ideas we can on how to make our events better. You know, and I have Francis and Tyrell come from Shepherd and Wendy and all of our meeting staff, we come and we sit there and, and usually it will start with, uh, as me being the marketing guy, I'll start with you know circus animals, uh, trapezes and complete craziness and then the people that have to execute it try and rein me in uh, on what we really can actually execute, right? So the first thing when the Cirque du Soleil thing came up with the chairs, Francis says, no, we can't do that. <laughs> so, um, but, but I saw it and I know there's a picture so I'm thinking we can. But, you know, so th that's how we do these creative sessions, and it's, our shows have come a long way in the last three years. Uh, we were probably a good five to six years of a de declining attendance, both from a membership standpoint and a floor space standpoint, to now uh, we really don't have enough space. Uh, we struggle. We do not want to go to a true convention center, so we're very limited on the hotels. We have maybe 10 hotels in the country that we can fit in. You all know probably what those are. Uh, obviously, in Vegas, you got a couple choices, but outside that, there's not a lot. Because we don't want to go to that, now we're sold out and now we're trying to do some other things to try and make it fun. So, you know, when we look at it, we have some unique, unique advantage that some of you may not have in that for us, we run our shows more or less at break even. We're not trying to make money on them. Any money I raise on the shows, I can spend. So it is a little bit different in that it makes it a little more fun to do them. So if I can get somebody to pay for some crazy idea I have, circus animals or those chairs hanging from the rafters, I get to do it. So I have some unique things and some unique flexibilities. Uh, but the sessions have literally changed every single item in our show, and I would encourage you all to think about your shows that way, and we dissect. We literally go through past agenda, every single item. Why do we do that? Is that the right time for it? What was attendance like? We do typical surveys, but we all know 5% of people fill out surveys. And the people that fill them out are either the people that always come or the people that were pissed off about something. Hey, you had the wrong kind of rum, or whatever the silly thing is that they write in their comments. But, so you have to take surveys with a grain of salt, um, but you also want to use them as a little bit of guidance. And then we look at attendance numbers for every single item on there to try and gauge, okay, why didn't people go to that? And it may not be that the content was bad, it may be the title was bad, the timing was bad, whatever those things are. So we started with focusing on why members or attendees repeat, people that come every single time. You know, and from, from my standpoint, we look at our events really like a wedding. 
and as staff, we are the mother and father of, of the bride, right? So it's our job to make sure everybody has a good time, and everybody's been to a wedding that 45 minutes after the reception start, everybody leaves and it's a ghost town, right? But you've been to a good wedding where people stay till the very end and you're trying to pay the DJ. So the idea is, how do you get people to like being there and have fun? And it is a lot of engagement in trying to manage that. We have the luck of a lot of alcohol at our shows that we pay for and a lot of things that stimulate some of that fun, but it's more than that. It is an individual attendee having a friend at a show. So as I go through this, I'll talk about some of these things if you have questions, and I only have 10 minutes, but, and we can answer some of them later. But we've even segregated down to groups, men versus women, young versus old, uh, the business type users. There's different type of people that attend our show, a big retailer, a small retailer, whatever that is. And then we've divided that down to based on what they want to, want to get out of it, and then we do specialty events for that type of user. Marketing and communications, um, you know, it changes a lot, really. Marketing and communications probably changes every single year on what we do for our events, and, and it's evolved to today where we're going everything video first. We send them a promotional video. We're sending small local regional meetings videos on why to attend. Everything we do at our shows is as much video as possible. Um, I spend a lot of time in marketing because we also have an in-house agency. <clears throat> and all of the things out there, the digital, all that stuff, and, and Richard had said it earlier, we would tell you that for an attendee to come to an event, we have to talk to them on the phone five times. We can eat, the only people that are gonna come with email in the very first blast are the people that come to every single event no matter what. The new people that you're trying to get are those new attendees, it's gonna take five to seven phone calls to get them to an attend event. Um, you, you know, all the electronic and direct mail and stuff, it's great, and it, you're gonna get a few, but to get real numbers, you have to talk to them very frequently. Our expo, you know, we, after, we start, after I started taking the shows, we implemented some rules. One, you need to make the expo floor fun. Um, food, food, and more food. So we spend a bunch of money, but the one rule that we put in place, once our expo floor opens, there are no events allowed during expo time. And you know, because the, the exhibitors do spend so much money, the one thing we would get the complaint is, even if, even if the show was good, highly attended, the people that had a bad show will blame it on the fact that you took people off the floor during the expo. So we flat out don't allow anything. If they wanna have a training, if they wanna have a session, if we wanna do something, it has to be on the floor. Um, every meal from the second the expo floor opens is on the floor. Come five o'clock, the bars roll out. Um, some of our sponsorship package include bars, so we roll separate bars into those sponsorship booths. Um, we try and keep them there every possible minute we can. That's what makes us, from an exhibitor standpoint, a successful show. They wanna feel, look, touch, busy. They wanna have crazy amount of people in their booths and all the normal stuff that everybody would used to. The other thing is we try and help our exhibitors make their booths look better. It's not a true corporate show where we control the entire look and feel, but you wanna have the show look good because in general it helps lead into some of the perception after the show and getting them to reattend. So, you know, exhibitors that have, back when we used pipe and drape, we now use the fabric walls if you're not familiar with those, it just, they didn't look right. They're setting up the table, they have their one little sign. We're doing things, even if we have to spend money on signage or some other stuff to try and help them, um, simply to make the overall show look and feel better. You know, from a sponsorship and our exhibitor standpoint, you know, this is an area where we have a little advantage because we do have some leverage over our vendors or the exhibitors that come, or the bulk of them anyway. We personalize, we have the standard packages, kind of everybody does, and we probably call them gold, silver, platinum, diamond, whatever the dumb names are you come up, come up with. But every one of them starts at a package and every single one of them is customized. Um, we offer every vendor that's gonna have, and this, you, you may not like this idea, every vendor that buys a sponsorship, there's two sheets for the same sponsorship. There's one that he's gonna show his leadership team that is the true marketing sponsorship, and then there's the other sheet that would include roommate upgrades for the guy that approves it, things in his room, and other things we do for the people that have to do the work to get the show done. So we used to give all of our staff and all of our leaders and our executive and our board officers all of the room upgrades that we get in a hotel, we now give them to sponsors. Um, we literally will have people write a $100,000 sponsorship check because we give them a big villa in Caesars. Silly stuff like that. Um, a lot of our sponsorships not only include education sessions, but also include the ability to do um, small receptions. And we'll limit the people and we'll pay for it. It's a way for a marketing and sales guy to get a reception with a certain number of customers. 
without having to go back for another approval process. So I would think about that. Um, the other thing we do, the things that I don't think are big deals, which some vendors want, and I'll use lanyards as one. I think having your name on a lanyard, I would never do it in a million years, just like Richard. I, I don't get it. I put those on a Chinese menu. Because if somebody really wants to have the lanyard or a key card at a hotel, which we're going to go to the expense and do it, and it's expensive, they're going to have to pay extra for it, and we're not going to include it. And really, I do it at cost. It's all of the other stuff. And some of the stuff, just like everybody else, is stuff you're already doing. You're just trying to absorb some of the cost. Some other things that we do for our vendors to help sell space is we give them ideas. Hey, we've had a lot of people asking if you can do a cooking demo on this, or can you build a home theater room to show this new OLED TV technology? It's a way to get them to demo their product and take more space either on your expo floor or off the expo floor. If it's like a demo room, something vendor centric, you want to give your exhibitor, uh, we give our exhibitors tons of ideas on how to take more space. It's kind of that double whammy. We're giving them an idea, they get excited about it, and guess what? They have to pay for the space. Again, same, same thing. Keep, do everything you can to keep people on the floor as long as you can. Just like everybody else, your last day of the show floor, you always struggle. There's nothing you can do. Um, we try and pack everything we can. We add more food, all that stuff. It's come, it's come down to by the time they've been at an event for four days and out until 1 o'clock in the morning, and who knows, may, maybe later than 1 o'clock, depending on the city that you're in, uh, all those things, that last day, people are done. There's nothing we're going to do, but we're not going to cut that day out ever because all that's going to happen is people are just going to go home a day earlier. So you just leave it and it is what it is, and we walk around, talk to the vendors, do the best we can or the exhibitors. Um, the one other thing on sponsorships I want to mention is our top maybe eight sponsors, Wendy, we do what we call a top to top. We set up a meeting room, usually two or three of them, and they are a small reception for our senior leadership team that meets with the senior leadership team of all of the top sponsors. So there might be a guy in there playing a guitar and a bar and some food, and we walk in and sit there with them for 45 minutes. As good of an idea as it sounds to walk around the show floor to 200 booths, one, I've somewhat stopped doing it because we run into the challenges of the vendors that are upset. Hey, I didn't sell anything, I didn't talk to anybody. Whatever those things are, we let our merchants do that. So we just do it with our big sponsors. Big sponsors. We sit in a room, we have cocktails with them, we have a real business conversation, thank them for coming, and then we go right to a next one. I mean, it forces us to have dinner three times in a night, uh, but it is a unique thing that we do that we add in. It's just a way for us to personally thank those sponsors. Education is always tough. You know, you do tons of education sessions, you spend tons of time trying to putting them together, and half of them are going to be good and half of them are going to be bad. The one thing we've learned is speakers need to be entertaining first. Um, people want to be entertained. If it is a bunch of slides that are boring, um, it's going to be boring and you're not going to get great reviews. Um, you know, it, 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 it's tough. We are at this point now questioning the need to ever do a keynote again. We have our first show coming up in August that we are not going to do a keynote. Um, if you were to literally uh, ask your attendees, hey, here, here was our keynote, here's what we paid for them, I would tell you it's probably two out of 100 keynotes that they'll say were worth what you paid. Um, everybody's aware of those kind of keynotes between that twenty dollars and $50,000 block. I would say two out of 10 are good, the rest are terrible. Um, and it's hit or miss. The people that you don't think might be great, might be, aren't going to be good, they're rock stars. It's just, and the ones that are good, honestly, they're just funny. Has nothing to do with the story, has nothing to do with what you learned. As much as people want to say, I'm not going to come to your event until I know who the keynote is, that's just an excuse. Um, I personally am not like a keynote listener. I would rather interact with people and have roundtables or whatever it is. I don't think I take away a lot from a keynote unless it's funny. We had Joe Theismann, one of our best keynotes ever, and it was just, he was funny. He made fun of himself the entire time. People were dying laughing. We involve attendees in education with panels, different things like that as much as we can. When people are hearing from their peers, they tend to get better reviews. Um, they get asked to come back more frequently. Um, we literally will, when we do the surveys on our education sessions, uh, if it's in the bottom half, we just don't do it. We only will repeat the top half of survey and we force, make them force rank education that they go to. So if they go to eight education sessions, they got to rank num one of them number one and one of them number eight, and the ones that come out on the bottom, they're just gone. We're not doing them again, nor are we doing the speaker again. It is the only way we found to try and improve our education over time. It's, it's the hardest thing to do and it's expensive. If you're paying people to do these sessions, it's, it's, not, it's not free. 
Um, the expo floor education is kind of hit or miss. It doesn't cost us a lot to do it, but we, we do allow vendors to do it, and we've done it maybe 50% of the time. Um, it is something to give people a chance to sit down and listen to something if they want to, but it's also distracting. It's not a negative. I just don't know that it's a huge positive for us. A anything for me before I give it to Doug? Let's go ahead and turn it over, and then we'll do a Q&A after. Thank okay. you very much, John.